Now, for this little segment, what we're going to do is take this solution, look at a particular initial condition, and go to Mathematica and see how to do these sums. So the initial condition I want to do is kind of a weird one. And one thing I want to do is share with you all the mistakes I made last night in preparing this lecture. Because because those mistakes are actually very common ones that you will probably make and were driving me nuts. And sometimes it's best to see mistakes, not the final product. But one thing, the first thing I did was I said, well, let's consider an initial condition of e to the minus x squared plus y squared. So why would I pick that initial condition? What is that? Yeah, but and what function do we call that? That is a name. Exponential. E to the minus x squared is a uh, Gaussian. Gaussian. Uh -oh. There's a few functions you should know. You should know a Lorentzian and a Gaussian. Go out and memorize them. Um, if I look at it in Mathematica, we'll, we'll skip down to the plot. It looks like that. Whoops. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I got some funky colors going later on. <laughs> but it looks like that. It's a Gaussian. Okay. However, as nice as the Gaussian is, it's a nice little smooth function. It's good for starting. Why is this bad? What's wrong with this initial condition? Talk to the person next to you. Think about the problem we're doing. Why is this a horrible initial condition? Okay, so why is this a horrible initial condition? It doesn't even come close. What's its value at 0, 0? <laughs> 1. What's it supposed to be? Zero. 0. It's supposed to be 0 on the boundaries, and it's peaked here. And, and the exponential, it decays, but not that fast. If I plotted that, it's not even close to 0 on any of these boundaries. So the first thing I have to do is recenter it. And even then, I'm never going to get it exactly zero on the boundaries. But if I do something like, and this is what I'll end up using in the example, 50 times x minus 0 0.5 squared plus x minus, I mean y minus 0 0.5 squared, what have I done? I've centered it at half and a half. So now its peak is here, which is good. At 1 half, 1 half, it's still 1. So that's good. The minus 50 is going to force it to decay very quickly. And so it's going to be, within any numerical precision, it's going to be zero on the boundaries. So we're going to be OK there. So that's, that's the good thing. So let's look at what we would try and do. The first thing is, to find the amplitude, and I'm going to make a little function for it, I need to project. Well, what does project mean? I'm going to do a double integral because this is not 2D, which is something we didn't really do yet when we did the linear vector spaces. But that's OK. I mean, that's my functions. I'm going to do e to the sine x sine ny times my function. Now, for the first one, I just left it as the e to the minus x squared, even though that's not a useful initial condition, because I'm not going to do regular integration when I go forward. But I wanted to show you, you can do it analytically, and you get all sorts of error functions and interesting, weird stuff. Um, notice. When I look at that, what's the funny thing you might notice about that integral? What's sitting out in front of it? A 4. Why is there a 4 there? No. It, it has to do a little bit to the integrating. For projection to make sense, what kind of basis vectors do I need? Unit ones. The signs are not the unit basis vectors. Now, since, I'm doing, since we're going back and doing a sum in the end, if you remember when we did Fourier series, I can either split my normalization and put it both in the series and with the basis function when I project, or I could put it all with one or the other. Okay? And the normalization of each of the signs requires a factor of 2. 
How do I check that? Well, I should just make sure that if instead of putting e to the x's there, if I put another sine and cosine, the sine and cosine I want, I better get 1. And that 4 is there to require to make it to get 1. If you're unsure of the normalization, you can always just check. Right? If you assume your series is supposed to give you exactly sine and cosine uh, and on the left, when you project with it, you can check that. Now, I do it numerically because, again, I want numbers. I want to be able to plot it. And I don't like all those arrow function stuff. Um, and notice here, for my numerical one, I've changed to minus 50 and centered it. Um, so I can run that. Did it run? I can run that. And you know, I can put in a coefficient and I get a value for it. Now, so that was the first mistake I had to deal with. I had tried this, and one of the things that was funny is when I then went to do it, because e to the minus x squared isn't centered at zero, I got a really weird approximation. Right? I wasn't even looking close to it. What also hurt was when I first did my plots to check, I plotted from minus 5 to 5. Now, my Gaussian looked fine, but I'll, I may do it when I get down there, you'll see that the approximation doesn't look so fine, minus 5 to 5. The next thing I did was I went to go, OK, we're going to do a series. And so notice in mathematics, it's pretty easy to do. I just sum my amplitudes times my sine pi, sine pi. And notice I'm going from 1 to 7. And what's this 2 telling me? Increments of two. Why am I skipping the even ones? Well, if I try and do the even ones, Mathematica gives me all this error stuff. It doesn't like how the numerical integration is converging. So we will abort that and realize, oh, by symmetry, if I just take a slice along the x-axis, right, there's my function. It's symmetric from 0 to 1. The even sine functions are odd from 0 to 1. And so they're going to have equal amounts on each side, but positive and negative, so they'll give 0. And they're exactly 0. Well, the numerical integration is trying to converge to 0. And what it's doing, because I didn't set precision limits, when you do numerical in integration, you have to set the precision you're going to work with and the error that you allow at the end. Well, since I didn't set it, I was using defaults. It was bouncing between like 10 to the minus 18 and 10 to the minus 14 and deciding that that wasn't converging. And so it actually, if you read the whole error when it finished, it suggests the answer might be 0. So it did actually give you a hint, or it tells you to increase precision. But obviously, I don't want to generate all those errors. So knowing that there's zero by symmetry, I, I just, whoops. OK, I think it's running. I just can create the sum. Yeah. This one takes a little long, not quite as long as the other one, so it should, yeah, it finishes. OK. And now I can look at, you know, there's the actual Gaussian. Now I'm going to plot the approximation. And notice I'm changing the mesh shading. I'm changing that because I want to show you it compared to the other one. So you can set up mesh shadings. Um, I'm using fun colors, you know, yellow, orange, pink, and red. And then I can plot them together. <laughs> and you get the cool, you can see where they're not quite exactly, you know, where it causes trouble, but that they're basically on top of each other. Now, as I said, what do you predict? What might happen if I do my other original mistake and I go, say, from minus 5 to 5 for this? Four. 
What do you think might happen? <laughs> yeah, what, what is it doing? It's oscillating. It's signs and the signs oscillate. It just knows all I did was force it to be zero in the domain it needed to go to zero, from zero to one and zero to one. The sign continues outside that domain. And this is one of those fundamental things about Fourier series, right? It creates a periodic function ultimately. So you can either think of it as having created this periodic function, or I can think of it as, okay, I'm really just in my domain and that's all I'm going to worry about. So you really have to be alert to that. And I, when I first did it, I, I mean, I was just like, oh, whoops. I mean, I was really panicked. I'm like, this isn't even coming close. Do I need eight zillion terms? What's going on here? Um, and then I, I finally had the realization that I was just plotting it in the totally wrong range. So we'll just turn it back to its regular plot. Now, the other thing that's fun to do is let's now make the time evolution. And so here I actually didn't suppress the output. What, and, and I've put back in the e to the minus, if you look up there, there's an e to the minus pi squared times i squared plus j squared, which is I'm setting alpha equal to 1. And now we can see the time evolution. And what do you notice very quickly about this? Yeah, so for all of these large ends, I probably don't really need to worry about them. Uh, in fact, I'll just keep ends three or less for my time evolution. So I'll keep n equals one and n equals three. And now, I can make a 3D plot. And one thing to notice, well, let's just actually use 0. So 0, I'm starting with a pretty big peak. Um, I don't quite have all the way up to 1 because I'm, I'm missing some of the terms. And at t equals 0, they do actually matter. Notice by the time I get, whoops, by the time I get to 0 0.1, it's already gone. 0.01, it's still kind of there. So now if I generate a table, I'm going to go up to 0.05 with my table. I'm going to go in steps of 0.005. Notice, as I said yesterday on the last lecture with this, I'm going to fix my plot range so that it's not auto-adjusting, particularly the z-scale, so we can see what happens. And then I'm going to use list animate. And now I've made a movie of it going away. And notice how cool this is. I, I'm only using two terms in the sine function. And I've really captured my Gaussian decaying away. It's actually quite smooth. Part of it is there's no sharp corners in this. It's not like I started with a square wave or a triangle wave. Those are harder to fit with sines because of the sharp points. But the Gaussian is nice and smooth, so it's pretty easy to get a good approximation to with my sines. So, any questions on that? Did that help with the projection idea? Where's the, wait, where's the time part? So the, the time part, notice, is right here. Right, that's my full solution. I solved in the separation of variables and saw that the time dependence is e to the minus lambda t, with lambda being related to kx squared and ky squared. That was my separation of variables. To get my a's, I use my initial condition. And that's all I need. Now the a's are determined. Right? And that looks like the Fourier series. Now, when you get to quantum mechanics, this may or may not be Fourier modes. This could be any weird linear combination of orthogonal functions. It might be spherical harmonics. It might be Hermit polynomials. It might be Chebyshev polynomials. It could be any Bessel functions. Any of a list of functions. As long as they're orthogonal, I can project to get the amplitudes. 
So the fundamental thing in quantum mechanics, which you almost never do unless you use something like Mathematica, you almost never actually deal with the time dependence because who has the time, pardon the pun, to do all those integrals and everything by hand and then try and draw those plots? But with Mathematica, I can write a function that does the projection for me. I can pull out the amplitudes. I can go back and make the sum. I can see which amplitudes are big or small. If you looked at the numbers after seven, you know, these coefficients are becoming quite small, so you know I don't need them. And then you can plot the time dependence and see what your wave packet does. So the whole concept of a wave packet, which we, we did in one of the earlier lectures, is actually useful now because in Mathematica I can make movies of the wave packet, I can plot it, I can plot my 2D wave packet, I could even plot a 3D wave packet if I'm clever. So it really gives you a lot of power. For the 3D ones, you have to do sort of contour plots in, in, and do strange things.